Hi, and welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. This is Dr. Sadaf Lodi, and I would love for you to leave me a review of this podcast and also to share and like it and share it with your friends, see what they think and let me know. I would love to shout you out on social media. And also, I would love for you to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Sadaf, OBGYN, as well as TikTok. I also have started a YouTube channel at Dr. Sadaf Intimacy Coach. I'd love for you to follow me on all of those channels. And most importantly, I'd love for you to become a patient. I am now accepting telehealth patients for sexual health as well as menopause health in New York and Michigan. So if you are a woman that is looking for a doctor that understands you and can actually take the time to listen to all of your concerns, reach out to me. Reach out at Dr. Sadaf at drsadaf.com. And I would love to see you as a patient. And now for the episode. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Salaf Lodi, and this episode is everything you need to know about the future of Muslim men. I know, should we really generalize? But yes, we will today. Before I get into it, the first thing I want to make very clear is that I am not giving any type of religious or medical advice. So if you have any concerns about your health, please speak with your healthcare provider. And if you have any questions about your religion, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. And this is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. So today I am super excited to have on with me a celebrity. I just think that he is such an amazing speaker and author, and his name is Harun Mughal. And Harun, welcome, welcome to the podcast. And please tell the listeners uh, about yourself. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm someone who has grown up in the United States with uh, a simple question that I think a lot of us have to ask ourselves, namely, what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of uh, people do we aspire to? How do we balance who we are, where we came from, how we grew up with the world around us, with our strengths and our weaknesses? And some of that I've done in public. And so uh, some work in media, writing, speaking, teaching. Uh, but all of that always comes for me out of a desire to learn, to improve myself and, and to pass on what I know and what I experience to others. Hopefully it'll be a benefit, which is one of the reasons why I'm so happy to be on this podcast. Thank you. And I know, I know our listeners are going to love it. Um, you are such an amazing speaker, but you are so humble and you haven't told us anything about uh, your background. So you've written, you know, lots of, you've written two books that I know of and uh, have been a co-author in another book and you've spoken at two TEDx's. So tell us a little bit about all of that. Well, it, it started for me uh, I think like a lot of Muslims of my generation uh, after 9-11. So I was in college when the September 11th attacks happened. I'd grown up in a very religious family, but also I would stress a very religiously literate family. So we were uh, a family that took academia seriously and we took our professional ambitions seriously, but we also took understanding religion very seriously. And after the September 11th attacks, I realized that based on what I knew and what I loved to do, which was to, to read, to study, to research, to understand, I had a moral obligation to try to share what I knew at a time when a lot of folks in America felt very confused, very scared, very uncertain. And that launched me onto uh, a public track. Uh, although it's not something that emerges from my personality, I'm, I'm more of a, the kind of person who's happy in a corner with a book, uh, not necessarily in front of a crowd, but I've spoken on, I believe it's now five continents, universities, mosques, synagogues, churches, libraries, uh, all kinds of institutions all over the world. It's been a blessing. It's been a challenge. Uh, I also love to write. So uh, a couple of books, hopefully a couple more on the way. And uh, right now, the the conversation that's been of a lot of interest to me and, and both for personal reasons and for social reasons is what does it mean to be a man? And I'm a middle-aged man. I'm 43 years old. Uh, I'm a stepfather now. 
And uh, a lot of these questions take on a kind of resonance, a valence that is more powerful and more intense, certainly, than, than anything I've experienced in my life. Well, that's amazing. So um, I can guess one of the continents is probably Antarctica. Um, is the other continent that you haven't spoken on, is it Australia? So I, I've never, uh, I, I've not spoken uh, in South America. Uh, oh. But I've, I've covered all the other ones, which I, I guess mm. other than Antarctica, I, I don't know that that would be. Are, are there Muslims in Antarctica is a good question. Uh, although uh, I suppose one day there's a there's a trip that that's waiting to be had down there. Yes, yes. No, I, I don't know if there's Muslims in Antarctica, but I'd love to um, hear your take. So you, I know that you've been talking a little bit about the future of Muslim men. So we're. Where do you see it and what in your research has made you kind of question the trajectory of that? You know, there's a saying that dropped into my mind a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I should know who said it, but I don't. So, But it's, it's not me, that the past is a different country. And I think every generation now, and, and certainly now we're talking about things like AI and, and new technologies. So every generation now uh, has a challenge that probably generations, you know, a few centuries back didn't really experience, which is the lives of kids are very different than the lives of their parents. Whereas yeah. I think a couple hundred years ago, obviously things changed, but rarely with the speed or, or intensity that they do now. And so probably like every other American growing up in the 80s, my parents felt very distant to me. And certainly for those of us who have kids now, the kids probably feel very distant from us. But <laughs> There was an added layer onto that, which is that the past wasn't just the different country. It was the fact that my parents were actually literally from a different country. And so yeah. uh, they didn't necessarily know how to navigate a lot of things. And, and who was I as a teenager to really know how to navigate a lot of things? And, and that's not a knock on teenagers. It's just you need kind of some life experience to help you navigate different, uh, different possibilities and, and potentials and pitfalls. And I've been thinking about that a lot because as as a stepdad, as someone who's active in a Muslim community, I've been thinking a lot to myself, uh, how do kids navigate these moments? And uh, our youngest is, uh, is in middle school. He's uh, very much a product of the Cincinnati sports scene. Uh, he'll talk all day about the Bengals, the Reds. Uh, yeah. But you know, and, and that's that's great. And, and then at the same time, I wonder, what am I supposed to give him? to prepare him for the life that I hope he gets to be able to lead, a life where he he prospers, he has strong relationships, he reaches his potential, he feels uh, a sense of purpose. And a lot of that took me back to this question of what does it mean to be a Muslim man? And I didn't really have a lot of, uh, I want to phrase this very judiciously, yeah. I don't think I necessarily had a lot of clear advice. I know here on this podcast, you talk a lot about how uh, conversations and sexuality and intimacy are not conversations that a lot of Muslims have yeah. uh, or even know how to have. And and I think conversations and masculinity obviously overlap with those. Uh, yes. And they're not that different, that we often don't have conversations on, on those kinds of right. things. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I think that, you know, a lot of these conversations are just assumed. And, you know, we take it for granted. And I think that especially growing up in this age now, you know, we think that actually, we know that our kids probably know way more than we did at their age, right, just because of all of the information that's available to them, and really that they're being bombarded by all the time. And I'm sure the you know, the issues of masculinity that you speak about, right? We see those images on TV. We see the, what we think we know as masculinity on in the media, in paper, in news articles. And, you know, I'm just really curious to find out um, what you've seen and what you've read about, you know, Muslims in the past and how they were and kind of what you've been seeing in different communities now. I, I um, there's a, there's definitely this intense polarization right now in America. We know about it. It's not a place to, to get bogged down in politics, and, and I don't want to do that. But I think a lot of young men are looking for models, and sometimes some really loud, sometimes abrasive voices dominate that space. Or, or sometimes they're the only ones willing to go into that space. Right. And I remember talking to uh, uh, an academic uh, in, in the Midwest who had this really interesting point. On, on the topic of Muslim masculinity, he said, and he is South Asian, 
like like ourselves and grew up in the United States. His, his parents did not. They immigrated here, I, I would guess, in 60s or 70s, something like that. And he said, you know, when we were growing up, we kind of were sometimes embarrassed by our parents that, you know, they had funny accents and they didn't dress in a way that was considered on the leading edge of fashion at the time. And and they could be awkward and and they had their particularities. And he said, now that I'm older and I look back and I look at my dad, I feel like he was more of a man than most of the people who pretend that they are yeah. paragons of masculinity, that here's a guy who left everything in, in terms of everything he knew, you know, came with his wife around the world at a time when it was going to be really hard to know what was waiting for them, uh, disconnected from so many of the things that he knew and, you know, worked day in and day out, uh, didn't necessarily have the stylish clothes or, or the, the right kind of car or the right accent or anything like that. And, and yet put food on the table and worked really hard. And, and with his wife together, they built a home, a family, a community it, with a level of dedication and sacrifice and commitment that he said, you know, I find absolutely astonishing that I can't imagine doing something like that. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean everyone has to do something like that, but that's, that to him, it was interesting. He said, to me, that's, that's a model of Muslim masculinity. It's obviously not the only model, but it, it's a kind of dedication and service and leadership and confidence and, and commitment that is often lacking. And so that, that inspired me to your question to go back and ask, well, what does make a Muslim man and, and what does our religious tradition say? And, and how does that apply to where we are and who we are now? Yeah, no, that's amazing. So, you know, going back to the research that you've done, um, I'm just really, you know, really interested. In, so what were the models? I mean, you know, if we look back, we can definitely say that the prophet, peace be upon him, was the ideal role model, right, for uh, male masculinity. And, you know, what we see when we go back and read stories about the prophet, peace be upon him, we know that he was a very sensitive man, that he was a very caring man. He was very trustworthy. We know that he really cared about his relationships. And even when his uh, first wife passed away, we know that he still maintained very good relations with her friends so that um, he kept her memory alive. And, uh, and we know that he was a businessman and things like that. So what uh, have you noted the key characteristics, I guess, in, you know, in the past and how you see that translating into the future? So there's a great uh, hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sort of an anecdote from his life where uh, a man named Amr ibn al-As, you don't have to remember the name if it's unfamiliar, but uh, maybe for some listeners it will be, maybe for others it won't be, but it's kind of immaterial. He's someone who's relatively new to Islam and uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, appoints him on a mission outside of the city where they live, outside of Medina, and he takes a, kind of a contingent of troops to check out the border to make sure everything's safe. It's, they live in you know, a very difficult time, volatile time, certainly not the kind of level of comfort or security that, that many of us are fortunate to be acclimated to now. And Amr is feeling really high on himself that he got appointed to this really big task. So when he comes back to Medina, having successfully completed the mission, uh, maybe a little bit too full of himself, he comes, uh, I, I don't know ex exactly where the story takes place, probably in, in the mosque where the Prophet uh, held services, peace be upon him. And he says, oh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He says, uh, who do you love the most? Which is a fascinating question in and of itself that he feels no hesitation or shame to just use the word love and and ask another man who do you love the most thinking it's going to be him and without a without a, even a second's hesitation he says aisha meaning his wife and amr's a little deflated <laughs> because he thought he was going to be in that in that first year but even that's amazing that in this gathering of men he has no hesitation to say the person i love the most is my wife like why wouldn't it be my wife and and then Amr says, oh, no, I meant among the men, like out of us. <laughs> and then the prophet says, oh, her father. Oh, okay. And then Amr, <laughs> and then, uh, Amr also has the quality of persistence, which I suppose yeah. is, is a certain kind of masculine quality. He keeps asking. And, and the prophet keeps yeah, naming people. Name. And he's like way down the list. <laughs> so, and he, and he says at some point, I was afraid he would never mention me. But I thought that story is so interesting and it packs in so much that, that first he doesn't think it's strange to ask who the prophet loves. And the prophet doesn't think it's strange to be asked that, nor does he think it's strange to respond his wife. 
and and that's not to him anything he's hesitant about in the least to tell everyone around him and and everyone probably expected as much i guess except for Umar. and then he mentions aisha's father and and it's interesting too that that if you look at how he treated his wife how he was open about his feelings towards her, the romantic gestures in their relationship, uh, the the kindness and gentleness between the two of them, and and even extending exactly you said to the family. So he he loves her father, and and one of the reasons why he married her is because he knew her family and he understood that a marriage is a relationship between more than just him and his wife, but the people around him and and the people around her. And I thought that to me that's just one. There's there's so many examples and and I'm happy to dive in wherever it it, it seems the most meaningful. But to me, that's a really interesting story because how often can we imagine that happening in a mosque today, where <laughs> the the imam or the preacher just says, "Yeah, of course, I love my wife and and I love her family and 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 why would that be strange?" Yeah, no, definitely, that's not something that's not a usual conversation. So that. I think that that's fantastic that you brought that up. You know, I would like to bring up, um, you have written a book, you had written a book, uh, it's called How to Be a Muslim, an American Story. And I thought that was, I heard you talking about that with uh, Wajahat Ali. And um, I thought that was such an amazing and book. I haven't read it myself, but I thought it was really impressive that you were so vulnerable in the book. And I think that vulnerability is a characteristic that you don't usually see uh, men exhibit, right? Uh, at least, you know, we, in this culture and society, we see stoicism more with men. And I think that you had mentioned that before. And I think that that was really impressive that you were so vulnerable in the book. You know, have you noticed um, any specific reactions that people had when you were so open and honest in that book? You know, what did that reveal to you about yourself and about the people that read the book? Well, I think I was open and honest, but now that I'm, I'm a, uh parent i don't know if i should have been that open and honest <laughs> totally now i'm being vulnerable in the other direction because now i'm thinking oh my goodness maybe i shouldn't have shared all of those things in in quite that way but to me it was it was a book where it was a book that i felt compelled to write because i felt as if i had been forced into a role uh, and and maybe to a degree forced myself into a role that i wasn't ready for and uh it sounds like a tangent, but there's a there's a great uh, series called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill about a church in Seattle uh, that that picked up a lot of attention in the 90s because it was very counterculture. It was sort of uh, far right before far right was a thing anyone was paying attention to. And and eventually the church fell apart and there were allegations of abuse and things like that. And and the one one of the takeaways I had from which I thought was so interesting, and, and this is how it applies to, to me and to this book, is that uh, the folks who, who did the kind of post-mortem on the church said, well, because of social media and because of the world we live in, religious voices get prominent before they learn who they are and what their role in the world is. Because mm-hmm. with social media and, and with the attention we can get, we project our voices outwards and people, and I think this is really important to the conversation of masculinity, people don't uh, know us and we don't really know ourselves either. And he contrasted that to back in the day, 100 years ago, if you had an imam in the village, everybody kind of knew who the imam was and what kind of person the imam was, right? It was. It's very hard to hide your character if you have to live with people day in and day out, right? People get to know who you are and you get to know who people are. But if you only ever engage with people in in this kind of very limited ways, snippets, edits, things like that, then people aren't seeing you and they might ascribe to values and qualities you don't have and and you don't get to work on those values. And so what this is a long way of saying that for me, writing the book very much emerged out of feeling like after 9-11, because there were so few Muslim voices uh, that I had to become a kind of spokesperson for Islam. And maybe there was some element of arrogance or presumption in that, but there was also a lot of fear and panic and anxiety because there were not a lot of Muslim voices in the public right. sphere and our country seemed to be going off the rails. And so I felt like, well, I have to say something, but I'm also a 21 year old. I haven't figured out a lot of stuff for myself. And and so after writing that book, I felt a sense of catharsis certainly, and I was able to step away and begin to pursue a relationship to religion and and with family and I married the right person and 
and find myself in a place where I invest now in community, in in sharing with those closest to me and nearest to me, and it's a different kind of vulnerability. But I think the theme of vulnerability is the same. I think we need to have spaces like this podcast, uh, ideally in mosques, in, in, in all kinds of settings where people can share uh, what matters to them and what's affecting them with the right people, as you pointed mm-hmm. out, right? So if it's a healthcare provider, if it's a counselor, if it's a therapist, whoever that person is, whatever the challenge is, everyone should ideally have the ability to talk to someone who can help them. Uh, and, and I think another form of vulnerability is is the really hard work, and, and sometimes it seems boring and certainly not glamorous, of day in and day out with family, with community, uh, with, with ourselves, with each other, where uh, there's no applause at the end of the speech. You just collapse into bed and you're exhausted. But but that goes back to that story that they didn't get the plaudits. Nobody was giving them any awards. Nobody was liking that, you know, their post at the end of the day. There were no posts, but but they did that work and they gave of themselves. And to me, it's how do we honor that and then build on that and in a way that's healthy for Muslims individually, as families and relationships with kids, with our parents, those younger, those older, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, my father has a similar story where he came here in 1974 and, you know, became established here and then afterwards brought my mom over and worked day in and day out and um, so that he could provide for his family. And I just wonder, you know, would I have been that strong to do something like that on my own? Probably not, you know, and especially uh, would I have achieved what I have? Now, you know, if my father had not made those sacrifices, you know, and we know that education in Pakistan specifically, I'm from Punjab as well. I'm from Multan. And, um, you know, I don't know. And my dad was from a small village and I don't really know how uh, much emphasis, you know, was placed on girls getting education. Right. Uh, As opposed to, say, like uh, their brothers or their sons getting educated. So I think that life perhaps would have been very different had my dad stayed uh, in Pakistan, as opposed to coming here. So, you know, really interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering what you think in terms of really the key characteristics of that define really what masculinity means now in this day and age for somebody to be able to thrive, you know, so I have three boys, three teenage boys, and, you know, I, I wonder, you know, what are the characteristics that they should have? You know, how should they be? um, What type of moral character should they have so that they can survive and continue to thrive in um, a society that may not always understand and know, you know, where they come from? It's it's such a good question. Um, During COVID, we started, well, we got to experience virtual Sunday school and found that it wasn't it. It, it didn't work for the kids. And, and that's not a knock on Sunday schools per se, just virtual learning is really hard at that age. And yeah. on top of that, they're, they're so isolated. It's such a, I mean, frankly, freakishly unusual experience for anyone to go through that you're in a lockdown for some of the most formative mm-hmm. years of your life. And so we started experimenting, my wife and I at home with different halakas, like religion classes, basically, and kind of hit our stride in the last few months. And, and now basically, what I do just for a very small number uh, of folks, uh, it was kind of first come first serve among uh, friends of our family and, and their children. So we've got, uh, I've got 17 high school age boys in two separate wow. classes. Cause I try to mm-hmm. cap the classes. Cause as you know, as the mom of boys, it's once there's a certain number of boys in the room, it's just, there's not so much you can do anymore. <laughs> and then <laughs> there's nine girls, high school age, uh, two of whom are our girls and, and their friends. Uh, and then 10 uh, middle school boys in a fourth class, uh, one of whom is ours, and the others are his friends. And by no means is this a Sunday school or any formal institution. It's just somewhere we get together once a week and we learn. And so I've been thinking a lot about this question of Muslim masculinity. It's been dominating my mornings, my afternoons, my evenings for me, myself, and and also for our youngest and for the community uh, uh, these kids live in, and, and also for the girls that 
you know, I'd, I'd love for them to, to find good husbands and, and get married and have families. And, and if that's meant for them, then, then God willing, it'll happen. And then you think, well, what makes a good husband and what right. should they be empowered to look for and, and to want and, and to think about? And so on masculinity, you know, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm recalling a story by a very, uh, about a very conservative South Asian uh, scholar from the 19th century uh, who went by the name of Ashraf Ali Tanvi. Uh, and, and this is not necessarily an endorsement or a rejection of any of his specific views, but it's very interesting. He wrote a massive book, like a book that is large enough to uh, wield as a weapon, which was a, a day-to-day guide to Muslim life. All wow. the different rules, ins and outs you need to know for Muslim men. Impressive. And yeah. when he finished it, someone said, you should write a book for women. And uh-huh. he said, okay. And then he came back a few days later with a book that was like this much bigger. <laughs> and someone said, how did you finish the book so fast? And he said, and, and of course I'm, I'm paraphrasing and summarizing here. He said, well, I added a little bit about menstruation and breastfeeding and pregnancy. Everything else is the same. Hmm. And it's really interesting that, that there are obviously... Uh, you know, in, in the Islamic tradition, there is uh, there are certain differences around, for example, prayer and, and public forms of prayer and traditionally men leading mixed prayer, uh, certain differences on modesty. But even those are, are not quite what we think they are. If you look at most traditional pre-modern Muslim societies, men and women dressed very similarly in terms of the fact that they covered almost all of their bodies, whether you're looking at the Persian Gulf region, if you're looking at South Asia, if you're looking at West Africa, if you're looking at Southeast Asia, uh, very similar. I mean, obviously there were, there were certain distinctions in style and fashion, but those weren't religious things. Uh, other than that, and, and I'm not saying those aren't important or that some of those haven't been used in ways that have been really harmful uh, in terms of forcing people to dress a certain way, you know, pushing government power onto people over how they dress and carry themselves. I'm, I'm not by any means okay with that. But but by and large, a lot of our obligations are similar. They're, they're inflected, of course, by who we are and what we bring to the table and, and gender is part of that. But exactly to your point, everyone is expected to pray. Um, everyone is expected to give in charity. And, and that means that men and women can and, and should earn for themselves, again, if they can. Um, Everyone is expected to learn about the religion. Uh, the, there's a very famous saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim man and every Muslim woman. And, and that's not to say there isn't unique content to Muslim masculinity, and I, and I would like to get into that. But I think that should always be prefaced by the fact that in a moral sense, the Quran, for example, often addresses believing men and believing women. And so it does reproduce this kind of binary in, in, in a way. But the obligations are, are largely the same. And so it's not, there, there's no, there's nothing in the Islamic tradition that says that relationships around masculinity and femininity are hierarchical. They're actually quite collaborative. And, and I'm happy to unpack that too. Uh, and, and that has to be, I think, at the foundation, because sometimes when we get into conversations around gender and intimacy, we talk about how men should relate to women, husbands to wives, parents to kids, and that's all very important. But in the Islamic tradition, above all of that is God. And so no one person ever has that much authority or that much importance that they get to take a position that is simply uh, uh, irreplaceable or, or, or can't be you know, critiqued or challenged or anything like that, because above every person is the divine. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. I'm really impressed that you, you know, started up like a, a Sunday school or at least just a halakha, you know, during COVID. I think that that was probably really the best time to start something like that up because you really didn't have too many choices, right? There was, and people weren't going out, school activities were canceled. And I actually, you know, that was the one part of it, to be honest, of COVID that I really enjoyed is that you were forced to be together. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. if you didn't really want to be together, you were, you know, and you really had to figure out things to do. And so I think that was um, really amazing. But, you know, I'd like to circle back to what you think are like the key ingredients of masculinity. Um, I know that, so I don't have any da- daughters, but I think that if I did, I would say that, you know, for me, the key thing in a relationship is respect. You know, as long as you respect your spouse or your partner, or whatever, um, I think that that really goes a long way. And I would say, of course, love does too, but I, I really think that respect is one of the key 
foundations of a relationship and of course communication i think that those are really important and as it relates to intimacy you know and we know that intimacy isn't just physical intimacy it's emotional intimacy and sometimes that's even more important in a long-term relationship than the physical intimacy but although both are very important um and we know, and I will say that I don't know of any other religion that gives sexual rights in Islam. I mean, you know, sexual rights in within the context of a religion. I mean, I don't, you know, I could be off and I, I definitely don't know everything, that's for sure. So, um, but I know, you know, I think that it's really impressive. And I think what a lot of people don't understand how sex positive Islam is. And that's something that I myself didn't know um, until I started to do my own research. And, and so I think that, you know, if I were to give somebody advice, I would say that, you know, to look for somebody that respects you, that understands their responsibilities and their obligations um, if they are practicing, you know, obviously we know that there are a lot of people that are not practicing, but if you're a practicing Muslim, um, you know, that there are certain rights and obligations that each person has to the other and to know that and to really, um, you know, and see if you can fulfill those obligations. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, for our high school classes, for my Sunday school, we're, we're doing books, a book a month which as mm. you can imagine was met with a lot of groans and yeah. uh, uh, concern because it's like they don't have enough things to do. So we're starting with the autobiography of Malcolm X. Ooh, uh, and, nice. and then for the, the boys, we're going we're gonna to read a memoir by a different Muslim man. And for the girls, we're going to read a memoir by a different Muslim woman. And nice. then we talk about the issues that come up. And we're in one of the early chapters, and, and this is really interesting, we're in one of the early chapters of Malcolm X, and uh, he's briefly dating a woman named Laura. I would assume that's not her actual name, although by now I'm, I'm sure she's probably passed. Uh, and he meets her in Roxbury in Boston. She's uh, a really smart, ambitious, uh, very well put together young black woman. Uh, they're teenagers. You know, she's, he's probably 16 or 17. She's probably 16 or 17. And she has a very religious grandmother who does not want her leaving the house because she's terrified of, of what kind of influences are out there in the world. And Malcolm ends up dating her um, just for a few f for a few nights. And on one of the nights he's out with her, uh, he meets uh, a white woman. And, and this is important because it's, it's charged by the racial realities of the time. And, and basically just dumps Laura for an older white woman. Wow. and sets Laura on a, a very bad path and her life falls apart. She ends up running away from home. And last he hears, you know, she's not doing very well. And he's obviously reflecting on this because he's horrified by what he did. And so I invited the boys uh, to, to have a conversation. And, and it was a little bit like pulling teeth, but, but it did work to say, what makes a good partner? Mm. And why did why was Laura's grandmother so concerned about Malcolm when she met him? Why was Malcolm's much older half sister so happy about Laura and so concerned about Sophia, uh, the white woman that he ended up dating? And were their fears legitimate? Were they illegitimate? And what I was trying to get them to is is a consideration of what makes a good partner. Sure. And and who are you as a person, and, and what can you handle? And 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 the reason I'm saying this is because we got into the conversation of religion. Should you marry a Muslim? Should you not marry a Muslim? And traditionally, in the Islamic faith, uh, generally speaking, uh, most Muslim schools of thought believe that that Muslims should marry Muslims, but that Muslim men can marry uh, Jewish and Christian women who are believing. And it's a very charged topic, so I'm not I'm not getting into that. This is not a religious thing. But I, I posed something to them and I said, you know, if you don't see eye to eye with your partner, yeah. if you don't respect them and you don't trust them, and that doesn't mean that you have to be exactly the same, but that you have enough in common, then how are you going to do the difficult stuff together? You Absolutely. know, one day you're going to have a son and maybe he's out dating someone who you're very concerned about. And, and it could be for all kinds of reasons, you know they're not, you know, your child is not paying attention to school. This person is not a good match for them, whatever it may be. It's religious thing, whatever it is. Um, will your, will your partner trust you to have that conversation with your, with, with their, you know, your son together, right. Or, or, or the other way around. Uh, you know, if, if let's say you're, you're married to someone and uh, let's say 
your daughter goes to her and says, you know, how do you feel about this? Or some of my friends want to go here. Can I go here? Are you okay with your partner having that conversation with them by themselves, right? Because some conversations dads can have with sons and moms can have with daughters and it doesn't just translate very well if the other partner does it. Not not necessarily. And, and the reason I was pointing to that is because it does get to this point of respect that when you ask yourself who you should be looking for or what you should be looking for in terms of a partner, are you looking for someone who's actually that, a partner? Or are you looking for external criteria in, in the form of a checklist? Are you looking for someone who, if God forbid, there's a crisis, there's a difficult situation, and there inevitably will be, if we're just talking about COVID, for example, uh, who is that person and, and are, they, are they going to be someone you can get through that with? And, and I think that gets to the Islamic vision. You mentioned sexual rights in Islam, and I mentioned the, the collaborative vision of gender, that in, in the Quran, I believe, God describes spouses as garments for each other. Yeah. Not, no, there's no hierarchy. There's no husband as head of the household. Actually, interestingly enough, moms get more respect than dads. And if you translate that into the reality of an extended family, that means that if you're the father and, and your wife, of course, is the mother, she's going to trump you in many situations, right? So it's a much more collaborative vision. And certainly for those of us who are Punjabi, we know that um, Punjabi women traditionally play a very strong role in families. Uh, and, and there's no, the, the idea of patriarchy in this kind of very narrow insular way to me seems a little bit uh, unfair. And, and and that's not to say there aren't patriarchal features in, in, in many Muslim cultures and many cultures generally, but it's it's often not the caricature it's made out to be. And I think some of that comes from religion and culture and tradition, where we have this vision of respect, of collaboration, of partnership, of of having similar values, and then allowing that to create a more intimate and supportive environment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like to, you know, we're, I don't want to run out of time because I do want to also get to your other book, um, Two Billion Caliphs. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So Two Billion Caliphs is very much a book that was designed to introduce Islam. And then in the process of writing it, I realized that it's not just about describing what Islam is, but what I think Islam should be. And mm. fundamental to that, which I think is very important in terms of parenting and relationships and intimacy, is this idea that uh, in Islam, we are all caliphs. And this is mentioned in the Quran in chapter 2, verses 30 to 40, if anyone wants to look up the reference. But this idea that Adam and Eve and, and all of us, all their descendants, are created, evolved, however you want to see it, uh, to be uh stewards of of the earth and, and custodians and, and mirrors of God's light and God's message. And so everybody has responsibility. And so the idea, again, that certain people are irreplaceable or invaluable is actually foreign to Islam. Uh, nobody can take anyone's agency away and nobody can, uh, can shirk their agency and, and give it to someone else. So men and women are responsible for what they have within their power to do. Uh, whether you know something and choose to act on it is something you'll have to answer for. And maybe someone has more power, more wealth, more money, whatever that may be. And, and actually, when we go back to the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his relationship with his family, uh, those around him, his children, you see that again and again and again. He tried to nurture in people the qualities uh, that stood out in them and, and ask them to then act on that. So when we talked about Muslim masculinity, we have Muslim men in the Islamic tradition that the prophet praises because they're they're gentle, because they love mm -hmm. animals, because they're brave, because they're warriors, bef because they're teachers, because they're good diplomats, because uh, they're strategic thinkers, because they're good farmers, right? There's all kinds of different qualities. What the prophet is actually asking is saying, this is how, you, these are your strengths. This is who you are as a person. And, and what are you doing with what you've been given? And, and for Muslim men, I think, and for masculinity, that's a big part of it, is that it's not like it, masculinity in Islam is not a box, right? We, it's not a cold, stoic thing, right? We cry during prayer. We hug on Eid, right? We show affection for each other. We line up side by side in prayer. We call each other brothers, right? We, we see ourselves as a family. We have emotion. The prophet says, if, if one of us hurts, all of us hurt. So it's, there is this openness and intimacy and vulnerability. And then the question is, okay, what do you do then for each other? And, and part of that doing comes down to what you've been given. Some, some kids may have a talent in one space and, and others may have a talent in another space. And I think uh, a, good, a good parent, a good 
a good teacher, a good community, a good culture encourages those strengths and channels them in positive directions, as opposed to saying everyone is the same, everyone has to be one way. That's that's not good for us individually, and it's not good for us communally. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, it's a really um, an interesting thought now that you, you know, uh, explain the meaning behind your book, Two Billion and Khalibs. I think that, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense on a, about the stewardness that we all need to have here on this earth. And I think that actually relates very well to masculinity in Islam, right? Or the future of Muslim men. I think that knowing and taking ownership of your uh, your life, your community and your responsibility in that community and what you can do to leave this earth a better place than the way that you found it. Right. And I think that um, it puts the responsibility back in the hands of people where sometimes I think they may feel um, helpless and may feel like they don't, you know, they don't have a say or perhaps uh, the community that they were raised in or, you know, and I, I remember talking to somebody once when I was um, growing up and they said, you know, at some point, right, we all have uh, different ways that we were raised. We were all, you know, different uh, backgrounds, perhaps, you know, somebody had more resources than another person. But at one point, at some point in your life, you do need to take responsibility. You do need to say, that's fine. You know, I was raised like this, but now, now that I'm an adult, now that I'm able to think for myself and own my own actions, you know, I need to move forward, move forward in whichever way I need to go to be a better person, right? You can't keep blaming your past. You can't keep blaming, well, this is the way I was raised. You know, I don't know how to manage my emotions. I don't know how to connect with others. You know, I'm I'm Punjabi and we're meant to be, you know, really stoic and angry people. And we just yell at people, you know, like yeah, at some point in your life, you have to grow up and yeah. be like, no, you know what? I, I can move past this. I need to make myself better. And, you know, how do I, whatever, make an impact in the world where uh, before I felt helpless. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting. And, and sometimes we, we confuse what we do for the foundations of the tradition. And then sometimes if you look at the tradition with fresh eyes, you see benefits that maybe wouldn't have occurred to people then because they don't seem as unique. So for example, uh, I often heard uh, growing up that the reason uh, men lead prayers and men have to pray congregationally is because uh, you know men have a leadership role. And, and then I started to think as I got older, it's maybe because men are a little bit slower with things like this. And whether, whether that's cultural or genetic or, or, I mean, that's a whole other, maybe it's a little bit of both. I have no idea. But how fascinating that we talk about the big stories and yet every day, five times a day, for years, all these men got together to pray. Even if it was just 10 minutes, they, they left their homes, they stood in a line mm-hmm. side by side. They prayed. It was a different person leading at different times, right? It wasn't like a clear, you know, it, it, there's no one set appointed leader to your point. Anyone could lead and, and everyone should be ready to lead. And I think that's part of masculinity. You should be ready to step up. And, and that means with your family, with your community, sometimes the community, like you said, isn't where it needs to be. So who are the people who are going to step up and, and help it do that? But, but even just more importantly, you checked in on each other. Right. If someone didn't show up, you'd be like, oh, where's so and so? I haven't seen so and so. Or someone looks sad. Someone looks sick. Is everything OK? Even just to, to imagine we live in a society where so many young men are so isolated yes. and, and don't get to talk to each other, don't have friends. Mm-hmm. Imagine if it was just a couple times a week. They just saw a bunch of dudes and, and they hung out with each other and they felt a sense of community. And it, it gives you a sense of enrichment and belonging and, and it gets you away from the sense of detachment and disconnection. I think that that's such a a beautiful part of the Islamic tradition. It's not the only form of of reverence or worship, but it's really important. And and even the way we pray kind of doesn't matter who you're standing next to. And so you end up next to people you may never have met before, and and maybe you'll never see them before. They're a familiar part of the world, different age, uh, different class, whatever it may be. And and so you get a sense of exposure beyond yourself and, and pull yourself out of yourself. And I know it's not easy. Obviously, we tend to sink in on ourselves, but sometimes if you have obligations outside of yourself, it's harder to get stuck in yourself and, and in your own mm-hmm. head and, and in some sometimes very damaging thoughts and, and fears and, and concerns. 
Yeah, no, I love that, you know, and when I like when you said, you know, pulling yourself out of yourself, and I think that that's so important, right? They say that one of the key things to do if you feel sad or, you know, um, lonely is to give of yourself, right, to others. So you're doing stuff for the community, you're involved in the community so that you feel like you're a bigger part of something that's, that's bigger than you are, right, yeah. that you are contributing to the whole and it's not just all about you, but it's about others and how you can serve others. And I think that that's fantastic. Um, before we go, I would like to know um, a little bit about your TED Talks. You know, I know you did two of them and um, I know we don't have time to get into all of it, but, you know, I'd like to, I'm a little bit curious and I haven't had a chance to listen to them, but I know you gave one at UC Berkeley and one at Columbia. And um, tell me a little bit about that and how you felt about those. So UC Berkeley was... Uh, the talk that I gave there became Two Billion Caliphs. It was, it was some of the ideas that grew out of that turned into the book. And and at Columbia, I talked a little bit about what the West could learn from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it was very big picture thinking. And and something that occurred to me as I was as you asked that question is it's also the little things that that his life and his legacy inspire in us. So I, I had an anecdote that I thought you you might have heard it before, but maybe some of the the listeners haven't is that when Muhammad was sitting at the table with his wife Aisha, peace be upon him, uh, they shared a cup. And I don't know if they shared a cup because they didn't have a lot of money, and people in the seventh century probably didn't have whole cabinets full of uh, <laughs> fine china, and, and you know they didn't have IKEAs down the street where you could buy six <laughs> glasses for That's whatever right. it costs. And so they had a cup, and Aisha would drink from the cup, and then she would pass it to her husband, and. When she did that, he would always drink from the same place she drank from. This is a very small romantic gesture, but it was a sign of the affection between them. And it's interesting that we have a tendency sometimes when we talk about religion to look at the big picture stuff, the you know the ways the world changed and, and leaders and, and conquerors and scientists and all of that is, is important and, and worth looking at. But I, sometimes I think we lose the human details and, and the little bits of affection and things like that. And, you know, that's that's a story that I love. There's another story that the prophet would often walk around in Medina at night uh, just to see how everyone is doing, if everyone was in distress. And um, his father-in-law, Abu Bakr, he would hear him at night uh, praying. And then he would hear Umar, who is uh, the second caliph and, and later became his father-in-law as well. Um, he was so loud when he was praying that the prophet would yell over the wall and tell him to lower his voice. But it's so interesting. And I think it's a great point to end on on Muslim masculinity that here you had this big, tough guy that everyone was scared of. And he was, he, he was fearless. He would say whatever he was thinking. Uh, he changed the fortunes of Islam in, in its earliest years because once he became a Muslim, nobody bullied Muslims anymore because he was so intimidating. And yet late at night when nobody was watching, he was up crying. And, and so he was hard on, on what he saw as injustice and unfairness, but he was also hard on himself. And so one of the stories is he cried so much that there were scars on his cheeks from the crying. Oh my. And I thought it's, it's such a, an interesting story that we sometimes frame masculinity as, as only hardness, as coldness, mm -hmm. as, as isolation, as stoicism. And, and there's a certain stoicism in Islam, sure. But there's also in Islamic masculinity, the, the, the husband who drinks from the same place his wife drinks from, uh, the leader who goes out at night to check on his followers when no one knows what he's doing or what they're doing, just to see if they're okay. And, and then there's the big tough guy who's crying late at night because he's scared that he's not living up to who he should be. And I think those stories create a much more beautiful picture of masculinity and intimacy and, and vulnerability than sometimes we, we get to hear. I love that. You know, it's uh, funny because I was just going to ask you, you know, what are some key takeaways or thoughts, but I, I feel like you kind of just gave us that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, any other thoughts that you would tell somebody to say, you know, so actually now I'm going to um, have my kids listen to this. Usually they don't listen to any of my podcasts. They're actually afraid of my podcast, but, but I will have them listen to this one for sure. And because they've heard you speak and they just... They really love you. Um, and they only heard you speak once at the mosque. And they were like, he was amazing. They're like, oh, my God, can we listen to him again? 
But, you know, I, I'd i love your, you know, parting thoughts on just, you know, young men in being raised now, you know, what are some key characteristics that perhaps they could aspire to or, you know, something that they should try to develop in themselves so that they can be a more nurturing human being, I think, you know, to others. When I started the halakha with the high schoolers last year, I told them something and they were all just very quiet because maybe they were thinking, why are we here and how long is this going to take? <laughs> and I said to them that one day you're going to be out on your own. Yeah. You're not going to be alone. You'll have family and friends, but you're going to be an adult. You're going to be responsible. And, and one day you're going to have to make the big decisions and, and you should make the big decisions. You, you'll have kids of your own, jobs of your own, communities of your own, and, and you'll have to step up. And I said to them, I would love for you to make those choices based on a deep relationship with your faith. But that's up to you at the end of the day. I, I, nobody can force you to do that. Nobody should force you to do that. But in order for you to be able to do that, you have to know your faith. And so I told them that they should think of the class and, and the next few years of their lives as a chance to learn about their religion. Not to think about it as something that they are obliged to do. Those are decisions that they'll make as they grow older and, and as they understand themselves and their place in the world. But when they have to make those decisions, they should be comfortable uh, understanding the context behind them. And in some cases, they may find themselves in places like our parents, where there are no communities, and they may have to build them. And then the question is, will they be confident enough in their faith that they can make those choices, that they can build those communities, and they can live those lives? And in the end, that actually makes their lives even richer and more meaningful and more substantively independent. That it's not actually about holding you back, it's about launching you forward, giving you more ability to do more things. It's, it's becoming more resilient. And so uh, I would hope that for anyone who's, who's listening and, and for everyone who's listening, that these kinds of conversations aren't just uh, uh, something that's abstract, but something that's deeply connected to who we are and who we can become. So I'm actually really, I think it's really cool that, that there's a younger audience too. And, and I hope they listen too, because as much as these conversations matter for, for people my age, and, and they certainly absolutely do, uh, they also matter for younger folks who should know that these conversations happen, um, that we can and should have these conversations, and that one day they'll have to have these conversations too. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you. And before we go, I want all of our listeners and uh, wherever they're listening from to know how they can get in touch with you. How can they follow you? How can they um, listen to the works, get your books, you know, binge on Harun Mughal? How can they do that? So I, uh, in the spirit of, of becoming more vulnerable in the local, I've, I've detached from a lot of social media. Uh, but the best ways to get in touch with me, the book certainly can be found, I, I would, uh, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the platforms and, and booksellers have them. Uh, the really cool bookstores have them. If they don't have them, then you know you should tell them that they're not cool yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the books are, are easy to find. Uh, some of my talks are, are on YouTube. And uh, I can share, uh, maybe in the show notes, I can share yes. uh, my email address Absolutely. as well. And, and people are more Absolutely. than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to hear from people and, and be happy to, to have a conversation or more. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Harun. I learned so much from you and it was such a pleasure. And I'm so grateful that you were able to take time out and come onto this podcast. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners did as well. So we are done here and it's been real and really intimate. And now everyone knows the future of masculinity in um, for our future male Muslims. And remember that this is not meant to be any type of definitely not medical advice um, or even religious advice, but it's just some thoughts. And so remember that if you are having any health problems, please speak with your healthcare provider. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. So thank you. So thank you for listening to the podcast and make sure you leave us a review, share and like the podcast. And if you leave me a review, I'd love to shout you out on social media. So be sure that you share it with all your friends. And thanks for listening.